The assembly is now in session. Assembly member Cook notices the absence of a quorum. The sergeants at arms will prepare the chamber and bring in the absent members. The clerk will call the roll. Ashajian, Alejo, Allen, Amiano, Atkins, Bell, Berryhill, Block, Blumenfield, Bonilla, Bradford, Brownlee, Buchanan, Butler, Calderon, Campos, Carter, Cedillo, Chesbro, Conway, Cook, Davis, Dickinson, Donnelly, Ing, Fior, Fletcher, Fong, Fuentes, Furitani, Gaines, Gaggiani, Garrick, Gatto, Gordon, Gorell, Grove, Hagman, Halderman, Hall, Harkey, Hayashi, Hernandez, Hill, Huber, Weso, Huffman, Jeffries, Jones, Knight, Lara, Logue, Lowenthal, Ma, Mansour, Mendoza, Miller, Mitchell, Monning, Morell, Nestande, Nilsson, Norby, Olson, Pan, Perea, V. Manuel Perez, Portentino, Silva, Skinner, Smythe, Solorio, Swanson, Torres, Valadeo, Wagner, Wykowski, Williams, Yamada, Mr. Speaker.
Okay, members, we have a quorum. We ask our guests and visitors in the rear of the chamber and in the gallery to please stand for the prayer. We ask our Assembly Chaplain Father Constantine Papadimos to offer the day's prayer. Let us pray. Lord, when we receive your love, it changes us. It empowers us. Your love takes us to new levels and becomes clear to the people around us. Best of all, when your love shows through us, it draws others to you. Lord, open our hearts to receive your love by following your will and showing love to others so that your love may shine through us. Amen. We ask our guests and visitors to remain standing and join us for the flag salute. Please join Assemblymember Fong as he leads us in the pledge. Mr. Fong. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Reading of the previous day's journal. Assembly Chamber, Sacramento, Thursday, January 26, 2010. The Assembly met at 12 noon. Honorable Fiona Moss, Speaker Pro Tem of the Assembly, Presiding Chief Guard D. Dawson Wilson, the desk, reading Claire Timothy Moore, the reading. The roll was called. Ashaw, Gian Alejo, Allen, Amiano, Atkins, Bell, Berry Hill, Block, Bloomingfield, Bonilla, Bradford, Brownlee, Buchanan, Butler, Calderon, Campos, Carter, Cidio, Chesbro, Conway, Cook, Dickinson, Donnelly, Ying, Fiora, Fong, Fuentes, Furatani, Gaines, Galgiani, Garrett, Gatto, Gordon, Grove, Hagman, Hall, Harkey, Hayashi. Mr. And Allen moves and Mr. Hagman seconds that the reading of the previous day's journal be dispensed with. Presentations of petitions, there are none. Introduction and reference of bills will be deferred. Reports of committees will be deemed read and amendments deemed adopted. Messages from the governor, there are none. Messages from the Senate, there are none. Motions and resolutions, the absences for the day will be deemed read and printed in the journal. I'm going to recognize one of my guests here today, Mr. Seth Dalton. Mr. Seth Dalton's in the gallery. He's the producer of the Grand National Rodeo, Rodeo in the Cow Palace in my district and also the Santa Maria Rodeo. Thank you, Seth. <laughs> Mr. Allen. Yes, Madam Speaker, I request unanimous consent to suspend Assembly Rule 45.5 to allow Assemblymember Cedillo to speak on an adjourned memory today. Without objection? Colleagues, please, uh, all members of the Assembly are needed on the floor. Uh, if you could, uh, staff listening in offices and members who are still in their offices, we need you down on the floor, stat. Thank you. We're going to move to business on the daily file. Second reading, the clerk will read. Assembly Bill 467. All bills will be deemed read and amendments deemed adopted. Okay. So items on concurrence, file item two, pass and retain. File item three, pass and retain. File items four, five, six, seven, pass and retain. File item eight, this is AB 593. Clerk will read. Assembly Bill 593 by Assembly Member Ma, an act relating to domestic violence. Ms. Ma. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. AB 593 achieves the original intent of SB 799 in 2002 by allowing victims of domestic violence to submit evidence that was limited in court. AB 593 helps the victims that still are not captured by the original bill. AB 593 is a bill which helps incarcerated domestic violence victims submit evidence that was limited in court in their original trial. By the time legal representation is found, investigations are conducted and habeas petitions are prepared. The current sunset clause in PC 1473.5 may preclude these victims from seeking relief. AB 593 also gives victims more time to receive legal representation by deleting the sunset date currently in the statute 
Please give these women an opportunity to tell their full stories. Members, I respectfully ask for your aye vote. Seeing no questions or debate, clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. 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 Clerk will close the roll, tally the vote. Ayes 41, noes 13, the measure passes. Just a clarification announcement, folks. Uh, file item two is gonna be passed temporarily. File item three is passed and retained. And I'll, so file items four, five, and seven are passed and passed temporarily. File item nine, pass and retain. File item 10, AB 1172, clerk will read. Assembly Bill 1172 by Assembly Member Mendoza and others, an act relating to charter schools. Mr. Mendoza. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I'm here to present AB 1172, a bill that allows school districts to deny charter schools petition on the basis of financial impact. Under, 11, under AB 1172, a school district will be able to deny a charter petition if the district is in negative financial status, has received an emergency loan, has declining enrollment, and will lose enough money to go from a negative to qualified status by approving the charter. This, uh, this bill is uh, co-authored by uh, our Assemblywoman uh, Susan Bonilla, who is a joint author, and I'm uh, respectfully asking for your eye vote. Mr. Donnelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, members. You know, this bill sounds good in theory that we're dealing with a problem that potentially consumes funds that are going to our districts, and I think all of us are here fighting for every last dollar we can get for our local districts. I know I'm fighting for transportation funds because we're looking at taking away the busing program in my community, and, and that's nuts because you're going to have a bunch of people driving on ice now. Um, but what you're talking about doing here, if you boil it down to one line, is you're taking away the parent's choice because in many communities, charter schools are the best school. Charter schools are the schools that are working. So every dollar that we put into a charter school is a great investment. And that gives parents a choice so that they can determine the future of their children and be able to actually provide a better future. We hear all kinds of talk about that in these, in these halls. But this bill would take that choice away, and it would take it away on a very weak excuse about funding and I urge my colleagues a no vote. Ms. Grove. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, members, we just recently had a charter school that came um, into an existence just a couple of months ago, and it had met with large opposition from the school district. And they said that it was this horrible thing. But, you know, I can tell you that the waiting list on this new charter school is almost 800 students long because they want to participate in an education program that is beneficial to their students and not in a failing public school system. So when our school system is failing and we give parents the opportunity for free 
freedom of choice. You know, a charter school is a great, great um, opportunity for parents to have choice in education for their children. And this is just, this bill is just something that's going to allow the unions and the CTA um, something that they think they need. But the bottom line is, is that parents should have the, the choice to be able to send their kids to a charter school. And if that charter school is exceeding and, and performing better than that public school, then it's about educating our children for a better future and a better tomorrow. I urge a no vote. Ms. Bonilla. Um, thank you very much. And I just rise to address some of the inf uh, information that's uh, already been noted about the bill. And I think it's really important to understand that when uh, in these difficult financial times we have a number of our schools that are actually uh, have gone into negative financial status. Some of them have actually gone into state re receivership. What is included in this bill is the fact that the County Office of Education must certify the financial status. It is not something where school boards can just claim out of the blue, well, we don't want a charter school because we can't afford it. These are, these are districts where the risk to all of the other students the risk to their education, the risk to the financial viability of the district itself is at stake. And on the basis of this, a local school board, which has been elected by its local community, needs to be able to use this information in order to make the financially responsible decision for every child within that district. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Uh, Mr. Nielsen. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the Assembly, it continues to astound me the assault, and I use that word with all vigor and passion, the assault on charter schools, a viable, a wonderful, and very successfully established alternative to the parents and to the children of the state of California to receive a quality education that they may not be in their local district for whatever the reason. This it's just another one of those assaults. There are districts throughout California in areas that we represent that are declining enrollment. That in itself could be justification, declining enrollment. And the enrollment of the public school would be declining because of their failure and the formation of other charter schools in the area. And if they're in trouble, it's generally not because of charter schools competing for students. It's because it's been mismanaged. And I won't cite the many examples, but one of those districts that had a huge collapse would be almost an automatic, no charter schools in that area. That is condoning and giving sanction to the failure of local superintendents, local school districts. That is not the pathway to quality education. Ladies and gentlemen, end the assault on our fine charter schools in California and vote no. Mr. Derrick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, after uh, thinking about this and having dealt with the uh, education issues, having four children along with the fact that I was vice chair of education for the first two years in this committee, I know uh, my colleague who is the author of this bill is a school teacher, cares a lot for kids, but I have also listened carefully to the other arguments and I've observed the onslaught every year over and over again of charter schools. There are now 900 charter schools in the state of California servicing 440,000 students throughout the state of California. They're doing a good job by and large. They're doing a better job than some of the other alternatives on a percentage basis. And I believe firmly we need competition. The question I have to ask is, what is it about this competition the public schools don't like? I urge and I vote. All right. <laughs> Seeing no further questions or debate, Mr. Mendoza, you may close. I, I appreciate Mr. Garrick's support, and I want to thank uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Donnelly and Mr. and the same woman. Uh, Grove support for choice appreciate that uh, but if innovation and choice uh, would add burden to a school district that is already faced with extremely difficult decisions such as eliminating adult school uh, eliminating counselors librarians or even closing a school then that district should have the authority to deny a charter because their circumstances would only get worse I respectfully ask for your eye vote thank you clerk will open the roll all members vote who desire to vote 
All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the vote. Ayes 41, noes 27, the measure passes. File item 11, AB 17, clerk will read. Assembly Bill 17 by Assemblymember Davis, an act relating to retirement. Mr. Davis. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and members. AB 17 would require uh, the California State Teachers Retirement System to report annually to the legislature on the ethnicity and gender of investment managers and brokerage firms who participate in managing its portfolio. It would also require CalSTRS to develop and report to the legislature a plan and a strategy for participating uh, uh, for per the, the participation of emerging investment managers and brokerage firms. This bill would sunset on, Ju on January 1st, 2018. I ask for your I vote. Mr. Norby. I appreciate any effort to uh, cast as wide as net as possible for qualified people to work with CalSTRS. Millions of teachers and and retired teachers are relying on that. But to ask them to count the ethnicity when there are literally a limitless number of ethnicities in the United States without defining exactly what they are, I think it's going to be a difficult task. The traditional ethnicities, races, colors, black, white, and red, brown, yellow, it's much, much more complex than that if you see many, many typical California families, including my own. I have a very, very large Arab American population in North Orange County. Um, are they white? Are they brown? Are they Middle Eastern, which is different? Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many ethnicities you want to count. Uh, the issue of gender itself, you have gender and you have gender identity which are not necessarily the same things as some bills on this floor have dealt with. So if this bill passes, uh, I wish the gender and ethnic bean counters well because uh, they're facing a task which can no longer be accomplished. Seeing no other questions or debate, Mr. Davis, you may close. California is America's showcase for diversity and productivity. This bill will not compel the state to hire based upon neither ethnicity nor gender, but rather will give us an opportunity to look at where we are in terms of what we have done to create opportunities for all that present to CalSTRS. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the vote. Ayes 41, noes 25, the measure passes. File item 12, AB 327, clerk will read. Assembly Bill 327 by Assemblymember Davis, an act relating to sentencing. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. AB 327 would put a measure on the ballot to require that the third strike in the California Three Strikes Law be required to be classified as a serious or violent felony as defined by Penal Code Sections 667.5 and 1192.7 in the same way that the first two strikes are unless the defendant has certain specified prior offenses which are particularly heinous, including murder, rape, and child molestation. Currently, any third felony if it is followed by two serious, or fel uh, two serious or violent felonies, automatically constitutes a third strike which calls for the automatic sentence of 25 years to life. This bill is necessary because current three strikes law has led to many unjust sentences over the past 18 years that were not proportion proportionate to the offense. As an advocate for fair and just society, this reality is quite troubling. Currently, 
three strikes poses a threat to the economic health of our state by perpetuating a financial drain on the taxpayer to warehouse nonviolent criminals. AB 327 would incur a one-time cost of approximately $220,000 for ballot-related costs. However, this cost is negligible related to the savings that would result from it. AB 327 would reduce the inmate population by an estimated 60 inmates per year, resulting in $15 million in annual savings in 10 years, and increasing annually to about $50 million in 20 years. These resources could be more effectively spent by investing in education, rehabilitation, and other meaningful economic development incentives of our state. I respectfully ask for your vote. Mr. Nielsen. Madam Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the Assembly, this is worthy, again, of a no vote. This is a grave issue. Three strikes came to pass because repeat unrehabilitated offenders were preying again and again and again upon our families, our children, the people of our community, and it's worked. It has worked over the years, I can tell you, from my years at the Board of Prison Terms, dealing with thousands of life inmates and parolees, three strikes was on their mind when they considered their continued criminality. And this isn't about a pizza thief and you go to prison for being a pizza thief. No, before you even go to prison, you've done a whole lot and have not been rehabilitated at all. And that's why you got there. And to be in this class, you have done two previous 667.5 or 1192.7 series of violent felonies. You have hurt people. The message of three strikes is being diminished, trivialized by this bill. The whole message is don't keep being a criminal. Avail yourselves of the resources. Change your ways. Quit being a predator on society and a liability on society. Even the initiative that was overwhelmingly defeated to modify three strikes several years ago did not extend the re retroactivity provisions to the degree that this does too. So all those in the class now will be able to overwhelm the courts with their pleas, let me out. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not the way to go. And at the worst time possible because of realignment, public safety realignment, tens of thousands of unrehabilitated felons are coming into our community. In a while to be hundreds of thousands of them, unrehabilitated, reoffending, they are doing it as we are speaking, and I fairly say within 10 miles of where we're sitting, there is some 109er out there committing a crime today, and they're doing it in your communities. And we're going to send them a huge message. If you're serious and violent and you keep being a criminal, well, you'll face a lesser consequence. Three strikes has worked. The voters rejected a previous attempt to compromise it. Let's us not do so on our own and particularly at not at this time, while our citizens that we represent are being victimized. Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I rise in opposition. Last week we amended this bill, we narrowed it in scope, and for that reason I supported the amendments, because if this bill is going to get out, it is better that it be less bad than it was last week but it is still very bad um, for several reasons. One of them has been alluded to. First of all, the bill is retroactive. That hasn't been addressed. It needs to be addressed. There are a whole class of criminals sitting in the prisons right now. They perhaps had all of their appeals. They perhaps had all of their habeas. They perhaps had all of the procedural safeguards that exist for them, and we're giving them a chance to clog the court system one more time to, wait, to make one more, perhaps, frivolous argument. We need to focus on the fact that the public has said, after you commit 
two, and let's be honest, most of the time it's much more than two, but if you commit at least two violent or serious felonies, we are tired of you. We are done with you, and if you mess up again, we're going to put you where you belong. If you can't live in a civilized society because you've been doing some violent crimes twice or more, as a society, we have a right to say, we're tired of you, and we're going to deal with you harshly. That's not me talking. That's the United States Supreme Court. The lawyers in this room may well know the name of Leandro Andrade. Leandro Andrade is the prisoner who went to the United States Supreme Court challenging three strikes, and the United States Supreme Court said, Mr. Andrade, you deserve to stay in jail. He'd been in and out of federal prisons, state and federal prisons, since 1982. He had nine convictions, including five for residential felony burglary, among the most dangerous crimes imaginable. You're in someone's house. Maybe they walk in and surprise you, or you surprise them. Five of those convictions. He was incarcerated for escaping federal prison. He is the man the Supreme Court addressed. He is the man that the Supreme Court said society has a right to be done with you after you have demonstrated your inability to live in a civilized society. And under this bill, he would be eligible to get out. We are going the wrong way. And it's unnecessary. I'll leave you just with a couple of clear points. DAs can plead down priors when necessary for justice to be done. The judge has abuse with respect to dealing with priors when necessary for justice to be done. The prisoner can challenge in habeas corpus the sentences. They can challenge a sentence not just on habeas corpus but as unconstitutional and cruel and unusual. And there's the governor. There are lots of safeguards already in the law. We do our communities a disservice by stepping back from them. Your constituents and mine have spoken very clearly. There is a class of criminal they're tired of. Let's not foist that criminal back on them. I urge a no vote. Mr. Amiano. Thank you very much. Um, and first, I, I would like to uh, Welcome, Mr. Davis, back. We missed you, and uh, I think I can safely say for both sides of the aisle, we offer our deepest condolences. But it's good to hear your voice. Now, I'm also standing up uh, in support of uh, this bill. Um, I think it's way beyond the time uh, that we have allowed. I think that the original intent in three strikes ha has been, in fact, trivialized already by the way it's been treated. There are uh, very egregious crimes on one side. There are uh, nonviolent uh, minor crimes on the other. We do need to review this. We do need to reform it. I say let the voters decide, and I urge an I vote. Mr. Hagman. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I also rise to oppose this bill. As my colleague from Orange County stated, there is a number of remedies in the legal court system right now to stop the, the bad placement of this kind of three strikes application. But it has worked. A lot of times we talk about public safety. What we don't talk about is the deterrent effect of our bills and our laws to stop people from creating crimes. The statistics alone will make this point. In 1993, there were 4, 000, over 4,000 homicides in California. In 1997, there's 2,500, a decline of over 1,500 homicides since three strikes took place. In 1994, we prosecuted between 900 and 1,000 inmates for three strikes. The last couple of years, it's under 200. This law is not widely applied. It's applied to those most egregious criminals who need this. Our population in California has increased 14 million citizens since we passed this in 1994, yet our crime in this state has declined every year and we're down 50% of the levels we had in 1994. 
What is the reason for this? The reason I believe in what this bill has is that there's a hammer over your head if you do criminal activity. If you want to do your third strike or you want to do multiple crimes, most of these things are applied with folks that have several felonies and it is the way to get them off the street. They don't stay in our state any longer to do their crimes. Either they leave the state or they change their behavior around. It's a very effective tool for law enforcement and for the district attorneys to keep crime from happening in the first place. I urge you no vote. Ms. Mitchell. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Madam Speaker, and uh, requesting permission to read. Without objection. I just want to direct everyone's attention um, to the numerous analyses that um, were written on this bill in both policy, committal and policy committee and fiscal committee um, that contradict some of the points that have been raised today. Uh, according to a recent report by the Center on Judi Ju Juvenile and Criminal Justice, CJCJ, counties that vigorously enforced the three strikes law did not experience declines in violent crime relative to counties that used the law sparingly. Despite their nearly six-fold greater use of the three strikes law, Kern and Sacramento, for example, the highest strike sentencing counties, expressed lesser reductions in violent crime trends than Contra Costa and San Francisco counties, which rarely use the law. In both uh, Public Safety and uh, Appropriations Committee, the district attorney representative talked about the fact that the DAs have some discretion. And we asked repeatedly, give us examples or give me a sense of the frequency with which the DAs use their discretion in these cases, and that was never shared. I think the whole notion of uh, mandatory minimum sentencing really has continued to tie the hands of the judiciary, a road that we've probably gone too far down as an elected body. Again, this initiative simply puts it before the voters, an issue that we often talk about in this body as being a top priority and what resonates with all of us, allowing our constituents to speak for themselves, if you will. Lastly, I'm not comfortable with this notion that we uh, simply throw a Californian away. Whether they serve three years or 25 years, they're going to come be released and come home to their districts. And so the question really remains, not only about humane treatment while incarcerated, but fair and equitable treatment leading to incarceration. And if justice were truly blind, we wouldn't have the gross exaggerated statistics in terms of the number of people of color who have been negatively impacted by the three strikes law. I know that's an issue that doesn't resonate with some, but again, if justice were truly blind, the demographics of those who are impacted by this law would be very different. I rise in support of the bill. Dr. Halderman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I was curious to the argument about the proportionality to the offense and the punishment thereof. I, I wonder what is the proportionate response? What is the proportionate punishment for the guy who gave us Adam Carvajal in Fresno. He was one, it was 2004, and his attacker inflicted grave bodily injury. Adam spent two years in a wheelchair before he was finally able to learn how to walk with an assistive device which we will, he will use for the rest of his life. That's Fresno. If you care about such things as numbers, he does represent an ethnic minority, although I think what's more interesting about him is he's a really cool little kid in Fresno. And I don't know what to say to his mom and his family when we say that the legislation we enact today excuses that animal, doesn't say that it's proportionate to put him in prison under three strikes. I don't buy that. I don't buy that if felony child abuse is included at something with which you can get a get out of jail free card. I don't buy that. Attempted murder of a child. Attempted murder of a child. What's the proportionate response to that? Three strikes is the proportionate response. I urge a no vote on this measure. Mr. Knight. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Well, AB 109, weakening three strikes. We've officially made public safety not a priority in California. You know, the goal of this bill, as said by the author, is to release some of these people, to put them back out on the street. You know, when the bill was written, it wasn't written 
in a way that we were saying that these people have done something so gross that they're going to go to jail. This was a repeat offender bill, repeat offender. These are the people that have had two felony strikes, convicted felony strikes on them, and that third one is the one that's going to put them behind bars for 25 years. Now, let me tell you, just on a personal note, I've been in court when the judge has talked about these, and when we've convicted somebody of a strike, and the judge couldn't be any clearer on telling this person, this is a strike, telling them the whole three strikes law, explaining them what will happen on that third strike, explaining that the third strike does not have to be a violent felony, couldn't be any clearer on explaining what is going to happen to that person if they continue to be a repeat offender. Now, the law enforcement community, any law enforcement community will tell you 10% do 90%. That is 10% of the criminals do 90% of the crime. That's any community. If you get those 10% behind bars, your crime goes down. Now, let's talk about that. Since three strikes has been going, violent crime has gone down dramatically. Today, most communities in California, we're in the worst recession in any of our lifetimes. And most of our communities, crime rate is at the 50s and 60s level. You got to think that three strikes has something to do with that. Three strikes has targeted those repeat offenders, taken those 10% that are doing 90% of the crime, and they're behind bars. This is working. This is not something we have to debate here in the legislature. I ask for a no vote. Seeing no further questions or debate, Mr. Davis, you may close. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Speaker, and also members. It's the old adage that says is that if everyone sees the same incident, they always come back with a different account of what they have seen. Each of those of us that are a part of this assembly have seen this bill, and yet many of us have seen something different. This bill is not about opening the doors of the jail and letting people out, not at all. What it is, it is a retroactive look at a bill that was not perfect. Certainly, we all share the core value that those of us who violate a crime should do the time. But we also should equally have integrity and be as vigorous in integrity as we are in making people serve time for the crime that they do. Having said that, can we not remember this whole issue of jail overcrowding? Can we not remember the tactic of realignment? The realignment effort administratively was to relieve us for the ineffectiveness of California to manage efficiently its prison system. The federal court came in and reminded us that that was the case. And I say to you, ladies and gentlemen of the legislature, that it's just a matter of years before realignment falls on its face because you have shifted the bad policy to the counties where there are a few available spaces. What then is the problem with this law? When you have a petty theft with two priors and you serve three or two times more than what the petty theft you committed is, is the reason that results in the overcrowding. Our failure to embrace analytical reasoning skills can also be the failure of this state, both financially and in terms of looking more carefully at policy. This is not a campaign issue singularly. This is a challenge in you doing your job because you've already won the campaign. It's a challenge of you doing your job as a legislator to not only say we must push crime, but to say an error that has caused the taxpayers who we represent. Unfortunate money can be corrected by us. But even more importantly for those of you who might just be concerned about a campaign and how you're going to look in it, why don't we just step back two steps? This is not your responsibility. The bill simply asks you to put it up on the ballot 
and let the constituents decide for themselves. Let me digress to correct a couple of facts. I know that my colleague from the Fresno area made some issues about what, in fact, the bill will do. Previous offenses that the prosecution can use to proceed forward with prosecuting a third strike that is not serious or violent includes murder, DUI that results in manslaughter, rape, sexual acts against minors, acts which were done while in position of a firearm or deadly weapon. My other friend from the Los Angeles County area who commented, uh, the current offenses that allow the third strike to be implemented, although they may not be violent or serious, include specified sex offenses, controlled substance offenses, and or the weight or volume of the drug that exceeds a specific amount. So that it means that if in fact a person has a problem with controlled substances, if it's a lot of weight that might indicate that they are selling it, that that person too is subjected to a third strike. And finally, if the defendant was armed with a firearm, used a firearm, or intended to cause great bodily harm, injury in the commission of the current offense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not an open the key and let everybody out of jail. This is not a challenge for us to use our question and policy for our campaigns. We are assembly members and we're acting to that end. 30 seconds. And to that end, I ask for your I vote. This is fair and this is just and it will save our taxpayers money. Thank you. Clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. 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 Mr. Davis moves the call. File item 13, AB 578, clerk will read. Assembly Bill 578 by Assembly Member Hill, an act relating to public, con public utilities. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. AB 578 requires the California Public Utilities Commission to implement National Transportation Safety Board recommendations on natural gas safety. This bill is in response to the National Gas, uh, natural gas Pipeline tragedy in San Bruno and to other recent natural gas incidents in uh, Mr. Fong's district of Cupertino and uh, Ms. Gaines' district of Roseville. These accidents may not have happened had the PUC and our utilities been attentive to previously issued NTSB recommendations. This bill seeks to make the PUC more proactive instead of reactive in order to stay ahead of this curve when it comes to safety. AB 578 received bipartisan support in the Utilities and Commerce Committee. I respectfully ask for your I vote, members. Seeing no further questions or debate, clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes. Ayes 46, noes 18, measure passes. Okay, members, we're going to go back to file item 4, AB 1208. File item 4, AB 1208. Clerk will read. Assembly Bill 1208 by Assembly Member Charles Calderon and Act Relating to Courts. Mr. Calderon. Yes, Madam Speaker and members, um, this is a measure I'm sure many of you have, um, have, have had an opportunity to talk about with uh, various uh, groups and individuals that support and oppose the bill. What I'd like to do first is go into a little bit of history and then explain what the bill does um, and why it's needed. Uh, the history won't take for long. It starts off that for over a century, the trial courts were funded by the counties. Trial courts were then given their own budget and, and administered their own budgets for over a century. Trial court judges are created by the state constitution. They are constitutional officers elected and accountable to the people. Now, recently, relatively speaking, the legislatures in its infinite wisdom decide to overtake the funding of all the courts. 
and to take the burden away from the county to save counties money. And it did for a while. When they took over the trial courts, there were a number of issues that were important to a number of individuals and groups that were supposed to have been addressed by judicial counsel in the form of some bill of rights to protect the autonomy of the trial courts. Now, I'm not going to get into the bill of rights. The legislature directed uh, judicial counsel, judicial counsel doing what judges do best, interpreted the statute, and interpreted themselves as complying with the statute. Had they complied, we wouldn't be here today. But we are here today. And why are we here today? Because some 15 years later, actually 14 years, in 2010, this state closed courtrooms. The first time in the history of this state did the state of California close its courtrooms. It didn't even close courts during the Great Depression. But we closed courts because of budget considerations fully recommended and supported by a judicial counsel as the only way to be able to deal with shrinking budgets and lacks of funds. In that same year, the judicial counsel transferred over $70 million to a software program which has been soundly and roundly criticized by the Legislative Auditor General as being ill-conceived, mismanaged, and poorly planned transferred $70 million approximately, and that $70 million would have been enough to be able to keep the courts open. But the courts shut down. This legislature has the responsibility not to run the courts, but to fund them, and to determine whether or not the state's priorities are being met. And the number one state priority ought to be to keep our courts open but they weren't. And so now here we are with AB 1208. It does only one thing. It puts the legislature back in control of the purse strings and allows the legislature to appropriate money directly to the trial courts so they can run their budgets the way they've been doing for a century. It does nothing else other than trial court funding that goes directly to the trial courts for trial court operations, all other money that goes to judicial counsel and the appellate courts will go to judicial counsel and the appellate courts. Now it has one, one little escape valve. If for some reason the judicial counsel or the courts don't want to come back to the legislature after the legislature's appropriated money, they can have a vote within their own courts. And if enough courts support transferring money to judicial counsel for some project, then they can do that without having to come back to the legislature. 30 seconds. That is all that is being done here. It's very simple, very easy, and it puts the legislature back in the, in the control and back in the position it's supposed to be in, and that is the power of the purse. Mr. That's Wagner. when I vote. Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I've been lobbied long and hard on this uh, bill uh, with both sides each appealing to my 20 plus years of practice and find that I have come full circle. I supported this bill in the Judiciary Committee. I was not happy with it um, thereafter and after having taken a longer and harder look have come back and therefore rise today in support. Critics of the bill from the Chief Justice on down will contend that it's aimed at remedying problems that are already past us with the change of Chief uh, Justice uh, Ron George, and uh, that it isn't aimed at the current administration of the courts. Supporters of the bill, on the other hand, will contend no, the problems that existed in the past continue. They were worse before, but continue today. I suspect that we as legislators really are in no position to resolve this internecine dispute amongst the judges. All we can do is look at the merits of the bill, this one, I contend, is a bit flawed, but I argue is still worthy of your support. 
the Judicial Council and the administrative arm of the court, which the council controls, has a reputation for riding roughshod over the trial courts. The author has given a couple of examples, and that is especially true specifically with trial court funding. Trial court judges are underrepresented on the council that governs the judiciary, as best I can tell. It is a significantly growing bureaucracy that siphons money we in the legislatures have directed to the trial courts off to things that are perhaps good ideas, perhaps not, but are not to the core mission of the judiciary. And all of, not all of them are particularly well managed, witness the court uh, computer system referenced by the author. There are courts, there are counties where their courts throughout this state are very well managing their money in this difficult budgetary time. Those courts, despite solid fiscal management, were forced to close down, again as mentioned by the author, because a couple of court systems that had not managed their money ran out of money. That resulted in a denial of services, that resulted in a de denial of justice to some of your constituents for reasons that had absolutely nothing to do with the local elected officials, your judges, and their ability to manage their courts. I think 1208 offers us an opportunity to fix those problems. Specifically, it allows local elected officials, the judges, every one of whom is responsible to the constituents in their county, to control at the local level the money that we have said they are entitled to. It substantially limits this unaccountable bureaucracy's ability to redirect that money, money like $1.9 billion on a computer system that doesn't work, the cost of which is ballooned as if it was high-speed rail, not a computer system, money that includes hundreds of millions of dollars on nice new courthouses with counties with just a handful of judges, millions for judicial education that the state can get for free. Now, I'll be honest, I do worry that 1208 allows a handful of courts to exercise undue control over the judiciary. As a practitioner, I remember a time when there was not uniformity. Opponents of this bill have raised that and it is a serious concern. But in talking with the proponents and in looking at how the practice has changed over my 20 years, it is clear to me that those problems are not going to be exacerbated. They're not going to even be returned to by this bill. And finally, I conclude with a point that some courts are perhaps properly so, concerned about the funding model. Funding goes to the trial courts on a pro rata share based on the number of bench officers. There might be a better way of allocating the funds, perhaps depending on caseload, perhaps depending on backlog. All of those things get worked out. 30 seconds. If this bill is allowed off this floor, it will keep the debate going. Make no mistake kill this bill today, all of the problems identified by the author and that I've touched on, die with it. We can get this fixed. It will have an opportunity to be rethought in the Senate and come back to us. It's a work in process, but it's a good step in the right direction. I urge an I vote. Mr. Fuhrer. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. We're on the verge of a constitutional crisis in our state that will affect every single member in this room because it has such a pervasive effect on our constituents. And that crisis is upon us because our courts are so severely underfunded. And here on this floor and in the Senate, there is not enough urgency around resolving that problem. What's the problem? The problem is victims of domestic violence having to sleep in their cars for fear of going home because courts are not available to them. A real situation. The problem is parents unable to resolve custody disputes in the middle of a very messy divorce, pardon me, divorce situation. 
That's a problem in our courts right now. The problem pertains to businesses who up and down the state are finding that their matters, instead of being resolved in a year or two, are now going to be resolved in five, attenuating conflicts and leading them to dissipate resources that should be devoted to hiring people and investing in their businesses. That crisis is upon us now, and I'm hopeful that this is a year where we resolve it. You know, three years ago, I was asked to get in the middle of resolving a court funding crisis, and then two years ago again, and we staved off some extremely significant problems that otherwise would have arisen. But last year's budget erased all the benefits of that months-long stakeholder process in which defense lawyers joined with plaintiff lawyers, joined with legal services lawyers, joined with union representatives, joined with pe people who build buildings for our court system. A big consensus around a severe problem that is now eroding because there's not enough money. Many of the reasons I oppose this bill derive from some of the arguments that the previous speaker just made, because this bill is a distraction from the fundamental issues with which each of us should be compelled to contend. This bill came to the Judiciary Committee, and it left that committee in a much different version than you have before you today. This bill has elements in it that would never have gotten past the Policy Committee in this House. And let me just mention a couple deficiencies in a bill that, as I say, distracts us from what should be our obligation to assure a court system is open in a constitutional democracy. Do we think that it's a good idea for statewide policies that many of us consider very valuable to be left in the hands of individual trial courts up and down the state? Because this bill doesn't do just one thing. This bill does multiple things. For instance, it says to each trial court, you have unilateral discretion between lines in your budget as to how to spend it. Now, many of us believe in a degree of decentralization, that's true. But many of us also believe in the value of self-help centers and interpreters being required and how we deal with domestic disputes in a way that the previous speaker said appropriately should have uniformity about it. This bill takes away the certainty of uniformity. Now, as a practitioner myself, I think it's really important for the rules to be the same up and down the state. The quality of justice and the rules that pertain to your case should not differ from one court to another. The resources available to somebody because they are poor shouldn't be different in one court versus another. This law, if it were to pass, allows that. But as I say, the most important issue before this, as far as I'm concerned, is this is well, for our body, a way for us to divert our attention from the real issues. And the real issues boil down to one word, funding. This bill doesn't solve that problem. And I hope that all of us, as we reflect on how to vote on this bill and whether to keep this debate going at the expense seconds. of other debates, whether we think that's really where our eyes should be focused. I rise in opposition to this bill today, not because the administrative office of the court is perfect. It's too big. It's made serious mistakes. But to say this bill is the antidote to those problems would be very wrong. I urge a no vote. Thank, thank you. Ms. Lowenthal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I want to thank the author for tackling such a contentious issue because by doing so, he has elevated an important conversation about our court system. Ultimately, it's a question of access to justice, of more courtrooms available, and not continuing to close one after another. Whether this ends with the governor's signature or whether the judicial branch puts its own house in order, we can't yet know. The Superior Court System of Los Angeles County supports this bill. Judges from around the state likewise support this bill. And I'm voting for 1208 today. We don't know how this will be received in the Senate. We don't know that yet. Neither do we know if the author has found the exact right formula. I'd be amazed, frankly, 
if we were at the right formula. But I think the best thing for now, and I think Mr. Wagner articulated this very well, is to keep the conversation going. And we do that today with an I vote. I urge your support. Thank you, Ms. Lowenthal. Mr. Alejo. And colleagues, as a former court employee, I was a former staff attorney for the Monterey County Superior Court, I rise in opposition to this bill. I spoke to all the judges in the four counties representing my area, Santa Clara, San Benito, Mon uh, Monterey, and Santa Cruz. Spoke to our Chief Justice about this bill, as well, among many other highly respected judges in the legal community. But one thing is for sure, our judges are divided. The first time, I think, in California history that you have that many judges in disagreement about the future of our courts. But we also must take notice that organizations such as CJAC and the trial attorneys are, for once, in agreement against a bill. But I think this bill does raise some very serious claims. Back in 2009 and 2010, I was among many thousands of employees across our state that were furloughed, where our courts were closed every third Wednesday of the month. The people that I used to assist working for the courts were those very victims of domestic violence trying to obtain court orders. Single mothers trying to obtain emergency custody orders, they came to a court only to find it closed. And it was very upsetting that at that time, money was being moved elsewhere at a time when our courts were being closed to the public. But also, our courts were backlogged as a result. At the same time, the computer system that we was just talked about, CCMS, nobody disagreed with the need for it. It was a, sy a system that was going to unify all the court databases in all 58 counties. The problem with that system was that the, the, rocket, the, the cost was skyrocketed. It was out of control. The contract was amended many times over. It was totally mishandled. And there was a hearings about that last year in the JLAC committee. But this bill does not, is not the way to go to address those concerns. There's other possibilities. This is the most far-reaching legislation that could impact our judicial branch, our system of justice, in 14 years. And today it's so important that there's judges all over the state paying attention, hearing to our deliberations on this bill today. As we mentioned earlier, before 1997, the state was in charge of funding our appellate courts and our California Supreme Court. The 58 superior courts were relegated to the, under the county. But in 1997, this very body, our legislature, made a decision to unify our courts. And it was after a very thoughtful, a very, um, a thoughtful process with a lot of input from a lot of ex experts in the, in the legal field that we made a decision to move forward with this unified system of justice. And this bill goes back to that piecemeal system that we rejected 14 years ago. In fact, the elements of the bill are inconsistent. They're compatible with the statewide system. In addition, a veto override that's in the bill would institutionalize the division that exists among our courts by allowing uh, two counties to be able to over override what judges um, made a decision about that could impact the statewide system. But I, but I also tell the Judicial Council and the Administrative Office of the Courts that this is the opportunity to make the changes, to, to take heed, to take advantage of the opportunity to address the serious concerns raised by their judges. Our Chief Justice has only been in her position about 11 months. That's not a lot of time to make the needed changes on issues that are so important to our statewide system. Some work has taken place. There's some task force, some policy changes but more are forthcoming. And just to mention a few, there's an independent analysis on the CCMS system, the Grant Thornton Report, that will be released this spring with recommendations, with more information, with insight to inform the legislature about how this system has worked or not worked. There's a strategic evaluation committee. It's an audit of this AOC that's also going to be released in the next two, three months. That's information that is critical for us to make a, a decision that's so far reaching on our courts. 30 seconds, Mr. And in Alejo. addition, the JLAC committee may also have another hearing in the next month or so to further review the needs of our courts. But it's time for 
to take a time out on CCS. They must reduce administration in the courts. They must bring employees to the table as well. But it's a time for our, the leadership of our courts to make the changes. But this bill is not the way to go. I ask for a no vote today. Thank you, Mr. Alejo. Mr. Dickinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I must rise this afternoon in opposition to this bill. For you see, although I voted for this bill in the Judiciary Committee, albeit reluctantly, this bill is not at all the same as it left the Judiciary Committee. In fact, it is virtually entirely different in its core aspects than that bill which was worked through and agreed upon as it left the Judiciary Committee. And unfortunately, it has reincorporated a number of the elements, many of which you have heard others speak about already, which were objectionable from the point of view of ensuring the fair administration of justice across the entire state of California. We all bring our experience to this chamber. And my experience includes that of a litigator who appeared in courts throughout Northern California and indeed throughout the state of California. And as a former county supervisor at the time that the state assumed trial court responsibilities. As a litigator, I saw enormous disparities from smaller counties that simply couldn't afford to offer access to the courts in the way that larger counties could. As a county supervisor, I saw what it meant to try to find adequate county resources to ensure that our court had sufficient, appropriate, and adequate access to our court. We struggled enormously and sometimes we, of course, fell short in organizing our own local priorities. This legislation does not address ensuring fair and adequate access to the courts. Indeed, it imperils it. It gives a small minority, as many as two courts alone, the ability to veto those measures that might, in fact, be integral to access to justice throughout the balance of the state. It imperils critical statewide programs, those that would ensure self-help centers in the trial courts, equal access funds for legal services, and interpreters in domestic violence cases among other statewide issues. We all have an underlying responsibility to recognize a co-equal branch of government's necessary ability to determine its own affairs. Forbearance is something that we all struggle with as legislators and in our daily life, but sometimes it is the right time to let another branch of government run its own business. Everyone in this chamber, I suspect, would agree that there are real and legitimate issues that our courts need to address. No one would contend from the Chief Justice on down that our justice system in the state of California does not have significant issues to address. But to try through this legislation to hold a hammer over the courts, and indeed when our Chief Justice has only had a single year in which to try to find the avenues to accommodation, try to find the solutions to those issues which have been identified is indeed unfair. Any of us, if the positions were reversed, 
would say we haven't had enough time. Give us Tw the seconds, ability to do this in an orderly manner. We should let the courts conduct their own business. I urge a no vote. Thank you, Mr. Dickinson. Ms. Huber. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's odd that I find myself agreeing with so many comments of my colleagues, even though we don't agree on the conclusion. I agree that this bill is not a perfect solution. I agree that our courts are being starved to death and what we are seeing is fighting over the scraps. I agree that we caused the very situation we're having to talk about today. Where I disagree from my, some of my colleagues is the best course of action for us today. I do not believe that this bill will pass the Senate Judiciary Committee in its current form. But I do believe that the Senate needs to be just as involved in this debate as we are today because the legislature caused this problem and we need to help fix it. So I'm voting to support the bill today, not because I agree with everything that's in the bill, but because I think moving from the assembly floor to the Senate Judiciary Committee is the best way to resolve some of the problems that are happening in our judicial branch right now. Everyone I talk to, and I talk to at least 20 judges on this bill, acknowledged that even though they didn't support the bill, that there were real problems in the way the courts are being managed and that they're trying to figure out how to fix them. Let this bill be that vehicle that helps us to resolve those issues sooner rather than later. Let this bill help put an end to what some papers have described as a civil war in our judicial branch and be the place where a compromise is struck so that we can put this issue behind us. But since we helped cause the problem, we have to be part of the solution. I urge your I vote. Thank you, Ms. Huber. Mr. Nelson. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the Assembly, there are many provisions and I'm not going to belabor them here, but the formula for the allocation of funds here now is really drastically going to pick winners and losers. There will be some who gain, but many more who lose under this formula in the long way, in the long run. And lastly, I would acknowledge uh, one of the great follies around here is to punt things to the other house. It'll all get worked out over there. You're putting your name to something that is here before you today, and you should vote in accord with your opinions and your best feelings of the folks you represent today. It may come back in a rather drastic other form, and you may be very responsible for that drastic other form. It's better to work it out here in the preferred form for the absolute majority of this House, addressing the concerns that many of us have here and not let the Senate do our work. Thank you, Mr. Nielsen. Mr. Hagman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I, like many of, of you, have been lobbied and been torn by this bill. But I will put some things in perspective for me. I'm on my fourth year here. The first year coming up in several committees, we started talking about the court's problems. Little have been effect. We keep saying, well, we have new chief justice a year ago. Well, for 14 years, the office of the courts have been in charge, and the judicial council has been there to resolve some of these issues. A lot of it is created by the legislature, which I agree upon. I also agree that this bill is not a perfect solution. I have some issues with some of that. But since it has been changed, I also have confidence that going to the Senate side, have more deliberations, will have this discussion brought here and now. Because I know this bill has been hanging around for a long time, and yet some of those issues that we all have with the current operation of the courts are not being resolved by the parties that have the control of that right now. We do have a constitutional duty of oversight and I think we've got to take that very seriously. That we need to keep this conversation going, and I'm going to support this bill today. 
Thank you, Mr. Hagman. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. As we look at the oversight that the legislature has in this regard, I am concerned as we look at the current funding status of our local courts that they are continuously laying people off. And at the same time, while they are doing that, we have an increase in some other areas of the court operation. I think that for courts to be held accountable, that they deserve and have the capabilities of taking the funds that are meant for trial court operations and using it effectively and efficiently if given the opportunity. I support the diversity that exists in the court, and I think that it is wonderful that we have a woman in leadership. But I don't see this issue being about that. I see it being about creating an opportunity for our courts to be effective and for them to deliver the services in the judiciary to our communities. And when that money is centralized and tied up somewhere else, nobody in any system can advocate effectively for that system better than those who are working that given jurisdiction. So ladies and gentlemen, I support this effort because as a public administrator, I trust that we have chosen the best possible talent in our courts and our trial courts throughout the state, and that if given the funding for the tasks that they are to perform, that they can do a more efficient and effective job. And I ask for your I vote for the bill because of that. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Ms. Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and colleagues. Uh, I spent a half a day at the San Joaquin County Courthouse about six months ago. And it's a great example of why we passed legislation, I believe it was in 1998, to centralize the courts in California and try and provide uh, an equal level of justice to all of our residents. Because we had a situation where some courts were funded at high levels, others were funded at low levels, and some courts' uh, cases were heard expeditiously, expeditiously, in other cases it took months or years. And if you go to San Joaquin, they're an example of a, of a county that was very low, funded very low. If you visit their courthouse, you can see why we've had a construction program in the courts, because there's no separation between prisoners, attorneys, judges, the public. It's not the example of the way we should be building courthouses today. And over time, when the budget was doing well, we started to equalize that funding a little bit, and things got a little bit better. Well, today, with all the cuts, we're back down, and it's not quite as bad, the same kind of disparity as it used to be. But the point I'm trying to make with funding is that this bill isn't going to correct funding. And the problems you see with the distribution of funds right now and the arguments are not going to be solved by this bill because all you need to do is take a look at the budget the last year and realize that the pie is too small for everybody, including the courts. And many of the cuts that we've had are not a result of the system we have, but a result of this deep recession that we are in today. I also want to talk for just a minute about the CCMS, the Court Case Management System, because there's no doubt that it's an example of how a data system should not be done. And it's one of the reasons we have the Chief Information Officer, now the, uh, the, the um, CTA, the Technology, California Technology Agency, because we recognize that we have to do things better and differently. But at the time CCS must begun, we had counties in this system that had manual court systems. We had counties, Contra Costa is one of them, their court systems are still on COBOL. And we had other counties that had systems that, that somewhat worked. And you can't have justice and have systems that don't talk to each other, systems that are manual. There's no reason to pay a clerk to go down and put files on a cart and bring them upstairs when we can use that labor in other more productive ways and we can and deal with courts more expeditiously. Now, San Joaquin County is also one of the early adopters of CCMS. What the, one of the judges that was showing me the system said, you know, I was one of the big opponents of the court case management system. Now I'm one of the biggest proponents of it. And he said, if we didn't have it, we would have no system. We would be shutting down. 
So we need to take a look at, at what's happening statewide, and I don't think this legislature should be picking winners or losers in the courts. More judges oppose this bill than support this bill. The system isn't perfect, but I think we have a Chief Justice right now who's willing to dig in to try and work with everybody and come up with a system that works. And if you do want a separation of powers between the legislature and the judicial branch, having the legislature control the purse strings is not the way to do it. I urge a no vote. Thank you, Ms. Buchanan. Mr. Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, I rise in support of this legislation. I rise in support of reforming the administrative office of the courts. It is a failed institution that is failing the trial courts uh, that it's entrusted to protect. For years now, we've seen the mismanagement. We've seen disregard for taxpayer funds. We've seen an unwillingness to change and reform a bloated staff, a disastrous computer system, unrealistic co construction and maintenance costs. All too often, that's just another day at the office for the administrative office of the courts. And at a time when local governments are struggling, when local courts are struggling to keep their doors open, the AOC has shifted billions of dollars away from ensuring justice with programs riddled with delays, ballooning price tags, and management failures. I want to highlight just quickly, and I know the debate's been long, but a couple specifics of what we're talking about. Recent estimates put place the cost of construction for a new courthouse in the United States of America. The highest cost is in New York City, $269 per square foot. Except for California, where the AOC is spending $747 per square foot in an area near Lake Tahoe, $644 per square, square foot in a small county in Northern California, 269 per square foot in New York City, $749 per square foot in rural California. Imagine the courthouses we could construct if we just adopted the high cost of New York City. Let's look at their maintenance costs. This is an organization that spent $8,000 for gum repair, $5,000 to paint a closet. Our colleagues have mentioned oversight hearings, which is our job. And two years ago, the AOC came before the Accountability and Administrative Review Committee, and they promised that the error of overinflated maintenance costs was over. They said they understood that in a budget deficit, when vital core services are being cut, that you couldn't waste any taxpayer funds. And then we just saw $21,000 to replace lights in a parking lot in Los Angeles. In my county in San Diego, they spent $210 to pave a parking lot that they don't even own. They spent another $200,000 to pave a parking lot that they lease month to month. In two years, the culture remains unchanged. It is a bureaucracy that despite the oversight, despite the incentives from this body, despite the warnings from this body, that says we're counting on you to change, to do the right thing, to reform yourself, is incapable of doing it. We've all talked at length here about pay and pensions. It dominates all of the headlines. So let's talk about the AOC. In 2010, when local judges were taking voluntary pay cuts, local judges were voluntarily cutting their pay to present further furloughs and court closures and layoffs. The AOC gave retroactive increases to 80% of its staff. At the same time, top AOC executives are not paying one dime into their elaborate pensions. Not one dime. The top 30 executives receive a 22.5% contribution at taxpayer expense. Imagine the savings if we just made them live by the same rules that judges that they're supposed to be supporting lived by. Truly, the icing on the cake for the administrative office of the courts has to be the CCMS system. Now, we can all support technology. We can all want our taxpayer funds to be better spent, but that's not an excuse to waste money. When this system was proposed, it was $206, $206 million, and it would be ready and operating by 2009. The AOC now estimates the system will take over $2 billion of funds and not be ready until 2016. The state's independent auditor has cited the AOC's inadequate oversight and poor management practices. 
as the prime factor in the tenfold cost increase and seven year delay. Members, we cannot sit idly by and watch an organization continue to waste taxpayer funds in a period when we are asking so many to do so much with so little. You're going to have friends on all sides of bills all the time. But it's our obligation to side with the taxpayers. It's our obligation to ensure that we are promoting every agency of the state government to be effective, efficient, and transparent. And I rise in support of this measure to send a clear signal to the AOC that reform is coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Mr. Calderon, you may close. I'll attempt to be brief, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just want to respond to the issues that have been raised, uh, starting with um, the comment made by Ms. Buchanan that more judges oppose this bill than support it. Well, that just simply isn't true. There are courts representing over half of the judges in this state that support this bill. Los Angeles Superior Court, Superior Court of Amador, Superior Court Kern County, Mariposa County, Mono County, uh, Sacramento County, San Mateo County, Peace Officers Research Association supports this. Fifteen presiding judges from the Los Angeles Superior Court wrote a letter in support of this. Look, I, I understand that this is not a perfect solution, and I really empathize with my colleague, Mr. Nielsen's, about punting to the Senate. Why, why punt this over to the Senate? Let's do our work. Well, if it's up to me, I'd eliminate the Senate altogether. <laughs> but I don't know that we're going to be able to do that. The, in, the interesting point, uh, or, or a point I want to make here, is that every spoker, <laughs> every spoker, every person that spoke whether for or against the bill, acknowledge that there are problems with how monies are allocated to the courts. I think that is enough of a recognition on our part to keep the debate going, to try and find a solution. Now, I've heard this argument about that the Chief Justice has only been here for one year, or, or, or she needs more time. Well, I gave her more time. I didn't take this bill up last year. It's been nearly a year. And what's changed? Judicial Council is still going forward with CCMS, going to deploy it to 11 more courts. And Mr. Vickery, who was asked to resign by some of the members in this House and did resign, is still working there, uh, you know, on his vacation. <laughs> He's using vacation time. I, I wish I had his vacation time. We're in a constitutional crisis. I agree with Mr. Fuhrer. We're in a constitutional crisis, and we need to bring these courts back together. This is not a distraction. This is a problem. This issue existed before 1208, and it will exist whether 1208 passes or not. It's the legislature's responsibility to be able to exercise its authority. That is the way our constitutional system works. We need to step up and do that. I agree with Ms. Huber. We created this problem. We need to be part of the fix. And finally, um, let me just say that um, we need to keep our courts open. I can't think of any greater threat to all of the individuals that were mentioned by Mr. Fuhr in terms of issues and cases and problems that are out there. We need to address that, and we need to keep faith with those people who elected us. And the one way we can do that is to keep our doors open. This CCMS project costs over $500 million to date. If, if Judicial Council had not proceeded down this road, there would be $500 million today in the trial court trust fund to meet the cuts that the governor imposed upon the courts last year with $150 million to spare. We need to prioritize. Sure, we need a software system. I agree if it's possible to do so. It may not be possible. But our first priority is to keep the doors of the courtroom 
open and to keep faith with the people who elected us. I ask for an I vote. Thank you, Mr. Calderon. If you'll permit me, seeing no members seeking recognition to spoke, we will move on. The clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. 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 Mr. Calderon moves the call. Mr. Nielsen, for what purpose? Mr. Speaker, for the purpose of an introduction, if I may. Without objection. Uh, on the gallery, we have Miss uh, Butte County. I say Miss Tehama because my wife was a Miss Tehama County, hence I take these things very seriously. Excuse me. Miss Butte County, I'm going to name them very quickly. Uh, Marcy Boggs, Danielle Hart, Kristen Baker, Elisa Belzer, Marisa uh, Bellevier, uh, Raina White Wright, and Megan Oliver and Brianna Brockman, uh, the California State Junior Ambassador, uh, up here uh, seeing their state capitol today. Welcome. We will now proceed with file item 14, AB 640. The clerk will read. Assembly Bill 640 by Assemblymember Logan, act relating to water quality. Mr. Logue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> AB 640 would expand an existing program that provides relief to small communities that face financial hardships. Currently, the State Water Board and the Regional Water Boards may al allow publicly owned wastewater treatment plants to pay the cost of their fines towards compliance projects. This program makes it possible for small rural communities to come into compliance with water quality laws. AB 640 would simply raise the population limit from 10,000 to 20,000. My staff estimates that 28 communities would qualify under this expansion. This bill has received strong bipartisan support. I will continue to work with those who have concerns with this bill. I ask your I vote. Mr. Chesbro. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise in support of this bill. Uh, small communities need assistance in complying with these laws and uh, this is just a little bit of flexibility for the very smallest communities in the state. Again, not to let them off the hook, not to, con not to uh, pollute, but rather to, uh, to reach compliance. I urge you I vote. Mr. Wykowski. Mr. Wykowski. Um, Madam Speaker, I rise in support of the bill. It is designed for these small, low-income uh, communities that need some help. I understand, and we all understand, that penalties are designed to discourage illegal uh, activities. And, but in these cases, in these communities with less than 20,000 people, um, the, we're going to use these penalties, these fines, and fix the problem, finally get to it. So areas like Tulare, Fresno, Kings, and Kern County, where these uh, communities exist, where they need this flexibility to fix their wastewater treatment. I urge an I vote. Seeing no further questions or debate, clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes. I 69 knows one, measure passes. File item 15, pass and retain. File item 16, AB 1278, clerk will read. Assembly Bill 1278 by Assembly Member Hill and others, an act relating to health facilities. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Believe it or not, members, it is believe it or not, members, it is still possible to smoke in many areas of hospital campuses in California. While current law prohibits smoking in patient areas, waiting rooms and visitor visiting rooms, other areas of hospitals where patients, visitors, and workers congregate continue to allow smoking. AB 1275 extends the prohibition on smoking to all areas of hospital campuses. 
1275 is supported by the California Hospital Association, the California Medical Association, and it is sponsored by Breathe California. There is no opposition, members, but simply, put simply, hospitals should be a place of good health for patients, their families, workers, and all visitors. Mr. Norby. Mr. Norby. I ask for a no vote on this. Um, if the American Hospital Association wants to ban tobacco on their hospitals, or the California Hospital Association wants to do that, let them do it. There's no state law requiring that hospitals allow tobacco smoking anywhere. Uh, I don't know if the bill is needed, and maybe the author can respond to that. Uh, under this law, it would be illegal to smoke in your private automobile with the windows closed alone in a parking structure of a hospital. Now, smoking is a legal activity, uh, and if we want to ban smoking everywhere in the state, we can do that and make it illegal, but I think the bill goes too far. Uh, it's not going to be, it's going to be widely ignored, especially in parking lots and private cars. And if the hospitals want to do this, I think they have the power to do it already without a state law. So I'd ask for a no vote. Mr. Hagman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I rise to oppose this bill, too. Just the way the language is written, California is already one of the least free states in the union. We get ranked by other colleges to do the surveys, not just with taxes, but the rules and regulations. Here's one that says there is no fine, there is no penalty, but we're going to ban this from any campus that has a hospital. Well, think about some of our universities and how far that may extend. On the public sidewalks, on the grass, like my colleague said, in their car, in their garage. I mean, at what point do we, we attack the freedoms of California residents? I understand the need and the desire to have this inside a building, inside where patients are had, but not in the outdoors, you know, 500 yards, half a mile, quarter mile away on a campus from where those patients are stored. I urge your no vote. Mr. Donnelly. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Colleagues, you know, the last thing that California needs is another law for the rest of the country to make fun of us. I mean, for crying out loud, you're trying to control the air. I mean, you're not CARB. I, I can't believe that, that you want to ban smoking outside. I mean, for crying out loud, it's one thing to try to control what happens inside a hospital room where it might be a danger. I'm with you there. I hate cigarette smoke. I can't stand smoking. But you know what I hate even more than that? Is I see these poor people have to walk outside of a building like they're criminals and they're sitting there puffing away. You know, every time they take a puff, we all know that they're getting closer to cancer. But at the same time, they're free to make that choice. We live in a free state. And whether I like it or not, I want it to remain a free state. I urge a no vote on this. Seeing no further questions or debate, Mr. Hill, you may close. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's interesting, there are about 73 hospitals in California who today have banned smoking. The entire Kaiser facility uh, and uh, network has uh, banned smoking in all of their campuses. However, what we've found is that the quit rate for employees, the qu quit rate for people that work around a hospital is greater when they are banning smoking in the, on the campus throughout. But one point that I want to be clear about is the reason that smoking, in my opinion, should be prohibited on a campus is a personal experience. Personal experience when a campus in my district hospital was being rebuilt. They did a, were doing a beautiful job, but they located a parking structure and you had to walk down a street on a sidewalk in front of a smoking kiosk that was established to allow people to smoke on that campus. That kiosk was right next to the sidewalk and the residents and the patients, and people walking to and from that hospital had to walk out in the street to avoid that. That to me is an inappropriate use and something that should be curtailed and stopped on a campus everywhere because just as uh, my good friend uh, from Southern California um, and should not have to abide by, should not have to breathe, should not have to suffer of secondhand, from secondhand smoke. So I ask for your I votes, member. Thank you. Clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote.
Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes. Ayes 45, noes 23, measure passes. File item 17. AB 970, Clerk will read. Assembly Bill 970 by Assemblymember Fong and others, an act relating to post-secondary education. Mr. Fong. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I'm pleased to present to you AB 970, the Working Family Student Fee Transparency and Accountability Act. This bill seeks to address the growing concerns of California's working families across the state that believe student fees at our public colleges and universities have increased at a rapid pace with little advanced public notice, minimal consultation, little to no transparency, and little to no accountability. The legislature has a responsibility to assure these taxpayers and hardworking families that their investment has been a wise one and that the increases in student fees that may occur for whatever circumstances may arise are both absolutely necessary and are accounted for by the state of California. This bill advances several key principles. One, transparency. Two, accountability. Three, stakeholder and public engagement. And four, sufficient public notification. These principles are embodied in the major provisions of the bill. The legislature owes it to the general public to be vigilant with respect to transparency and accountability when it comes to the public's hard-earned tax dollars or fees that the state public colleges and universities are charging families. I'm committed to working with all parties on further strengthening the bill as it moves through the legislative process. AB 970 is sponsored by the California State Student Association, the University of California Student Association, and has garnered support from the California Faculty Association, Greenlining Institute, AFSCME, and the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights. I respectfully request an I vote. Ms. Olson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to congratulate the author on taking up this issue. I think in concept, it's very supportable and would be very happy if it moves forward to work with you on some of the details, um, if that's on interest, of interest. But as I read the analysis, I'm concerned, and if I'm incorrect in any way, please correct me, but I'm concerned about some of the details because the tricky part is we can't have it both ways. If we as the legislature are going to cut funding for CSU and UC, and tell them that they can't raise student fees, and tell them that they can't cut programs without an extensive process of review, and tell them they can't lay off employees without notice, I believe it's 90 day notice, and tell them that um, they can't cut staff or faculty employees without extensive notice, then what we're doing is we're just pushing them into the red. Because as I read through the analysis, they would have to concur or I'm sorry, they'd have to confer with student organizations for 90 days before they give public notice about a possible fee increase. Then after that 90 days, they have to notice the potential fee increase for 60 days as people are commenting on it. Then they uh, have to allow 10 more days to allow their responses to the comments to be in print. Then that's five months then they could adopt the fee increase if they want to, but it couldn't be implemented for another six months. So that's 11 months delay between the possibility of a fee increase. Now, I do think we need to do something about the fact that we've had a ridiculous percentage of fee increases over the last few years in CSU and, and UC, which is why, in concept, I'm very supportive of the bill and would love to find a way that we can make it work but I'm very concerned about what we're doing to UC and CSU if we're cutting their funding and at the same time telling them that they have no options for immediately addressing that uh, lower funding level. So because of that, I urge my colleagues to vote no today, but to remain open to another fix um, or to working with the author if it does pass the floor today. Thank you. Mr. Block. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, many of my colleagues have pledged to fight any new taxes, new fees. For some reason, they don't see raising student fees, raising taxes on students as problematic. Now, clearly, I agree with the previous speaker that our, our colleges and universities need to be able to raise fees, to, to add more faculty if necessary, to keep classes open. This bill, and I, I'm a joint author of this bill, this bill does not stop them, does not prohibit them from raising fees. It merely gives the consumers, the students and their families, a right to weigh in, to tell the university systems why fees shouldn't be raised, if in fact students feel they shouldn't. And it also gives students and their families notice 
so that they can do planning. If we're going to raise fees, we should at least let the consumers plan for these increases so they can continue to stay in school, to, to put aside the money they will need to stay in school. In addition, in addition, this bill requires the CSU and UC after the fact to report on how they've used these fees. So, so they can't use fees for frivolous means or else they will be certainly censured the next time they go to raise fees. Now again, I agree with the previous speaker that this makes the job very difficult for CSU and UC and they need to do a lot of planning. Well, what's wrong with that? We're paying executives in the CSU and UC a lot of money. So let them use some of their resources to let students and their families know when fees are being increased so these students can prepare. I strongly support the bill and urge an I vote. Mr. Jeffries. Madam Speaker, uh, I rise in opposition wondering where, where the concern was for this requirement that we have long notice, long debate, long opportunities for the public to know about fees before they're implemented when the SRA fire tax was being brought to this body that is going to tax 800,000 homeowners, $150 per home, and we had about two hours before it got voted on. The public never even knew. And yet now today we have to have six months of notice before a fee is going to be introduced how do you reconcile the difference in approach when 800,000 people can be hit with a $150 tax without any advance notice by this body, but now we have to have an incredible amount of notice? I agree. The, the school, the education systems are being attacked daily by this body with the cuts. I'm not so sure this is the solution to fix it. I encourage a no vote. Seeing no further questions or debate, Mr. Fong, you may close. This is not an attack on the system. It's just a clear transparency and accountability act. Uh, there is also a not, notwithstanding uh, provision in the bill, which they have to confer with the legislature to get out of the provisions of this bill. And so this is, there's a notwithstanding provision in this bill as well to address your concerns, Ms. Christ Ms. Olson. And I respectfully request an aye vote. Clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes. Ayes 44, noes 23, measure passes. File item 18, pass and retain. File item 19, AB 744, clerk will read. Assembly Bill 744 by Assembly Member John A. Perez, an act relating to intellectual property. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, AB 744 establishes the Office of Intellectual Property within the Department of General Services with various responsibilities. To date, there is no clear accounting of what intellectual property the state owns or the types of agreements state agencies have entered into. In November of 2011, the Bureau of State Audits released an update on the status of state-owned intellectual property and the need to craft an effective policy that educates state agencies on how to protect their intellectual property. The disjointed system that we currently have cost the state more money than creating this statewide solution. As technology continues to advance, state agencies without sufficient knowledge of how to protect intellectual property will become increasingly vulnerable to unauthorized use and unable to capitalize on reduced co uh, contract costs or increasing revenues to the state. California has received national and international attention for work done in the area of intellectual property, especially since the passage of Prop 71. Despite the attention and acknowledgement of the importance to protect the state's intellectual property, nothing has been done. It has been 11 years since the first BSA report was published. AB 744 sets up a framework to determine what intellectual property the state owns and informs state agencies of their rights and abilities to protect the state's intellectual property. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Mr. Nestande. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I rise in support of the bill. And if I may, I'd like to suggest to the author as the bill moves forward to possibly encourage uh, state agencies to look at possibly using outside counsel or venture capital firms to find the quickest way to move some of these products 
to commercialization where, in fact, we can then make money as a lot of the UC system do does. And uh, thank you for bringing the bill forward. Okay, clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes. Ayes 57, noes 1. Measure passes. File item 20, AB 1246. Clerk will read. Assembly Bill 1246 by Assembly Member Brownlee, an act relating to instructional materials. Ms. Brownlee. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, AB 1246 uh, creates a more streamlined and inclusive process for the adoption of K through 8 instructional materials. It will do two really good things. It will involve greater participation participation of classroom teachers, that's teachers who know about instructional materials, and will also result in more instructional materials and choices uh, for school districts. AB 1246 allows school districts and requires the superintendent of public instruction, instead of the Instructional Quality Commission, to recommend to the state board instructional materials for adoption. The Instructional Quality Commission will retain its role in the framework development process, but will be involved in the review of instructional materials only at the request of the State Board. And finally, let me just clarify that the intent of this bill is not to restart the process of adopting instructional materials at this particular time, but rather to improve the process so then when our fiscal climate allows it, our instructional materials are adopted in a more efficient and inclusive manner. I respectfully ask for an aye vote. Seeing no further questions or debate, clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes. Eyes 44, nose 22, measure passes. File item 21, AB 523, clerk will read. Assembly Bill 523 by Assembly Member Valadeo, an act relating to ethanol. Mr. Valadeo. Thank you, Madam Speaker. AB 523 would simply stop state funding of ethanol derived from corn after the seat pit program expires in 2013. It is important to note that this bill does nothing to prevent support for ethanol that's not derived from corn. I have the support of environmental and agriculture groups. Also, Senator Dianne Feinstein led the effort in Congress to end federal corn subsidies on January 1, 2012. California should join this effort and send a clear message to consumers and the environmental community and agriculture that the nation's largest economy will join Congress to end state subsidies for corn ethanol. AB 523 passed that Assembly Transportation Committee 14-0 and has no opposition. I respectfully ask for your aye vote. Seeing no further questions or debate, clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes. I 62, knows 1, measure passes. File item 22, AB 1225, clerk will read. Assembly Bill 1225 by the Assembly Committee on Veterans Affairs and Act relating to cemeteries. Colonel Cook. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In recent years, a market has developed for veteran commemorative cemetery property. This includes monuments, memorials, and plaques. They have become very, very valuable in the antiques market, leading to thieves stealing the property from cemeteries. And it's, this particular bill is, uh, was called to our attention by a similar bill that was passed in New York that was prompted by Civil War property, actually gravestones, markers that were, were stolen from uh, Civil War veterans. Um, this bill prohibits the unauthorized sale, trade, or transfer of any veteran commemorative cemetery property that is over 50 years old if the property is currently within a cemetery. It will apply to anyone who owns or controls the cemetery where the veteran